coming in, you should have been handed a signing card and questionnaire. Um, we ask that you fill those out. We use those for headcount attendance. Uh, we'll continue to send those back to your professors if you've been um, incentivized to attend. Um, we also, as you can see, they'll have a questionnaire. We'd appreciate it if you fill that out. We like to get feedback on our speakers. We grade them, right? So it's your chance to actually issue the grade, so to speak. Um, and there's a box on the way out of the table that you will uh, drop those off. They are on your way out. We'll make sure that they find their way to the right um, professor and gather that information. Also, on your way out, you'll see schedules for the rest of Adam Smith Week um, for the various events. Specifically, our next event is this evening. Uh, we have a, um, a round table on entrepreneurship that we're doing in conjunction with SITE and Professor Klein and Professor Rol uh, Sobel will be um, participating in that along with um, Andrew Marcus, a student, and uh, David DeClaw, Professor of Management, will be sort of moderating that. So I encourage you to come out. That's this evening at 5.30, across the way in K202. <coughs> For those of you who may not know me, I'm Professor Peter Calcano. I'm in the Department of Economics and Finance, and I'm the director of the Initiative for Public Choice and Market Process. The mission of the Initiative for Public Choice and Market Process is, with, is to advance the understanding of the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. I encourage you to find our webpage, follow us on Facebook, keep up with our events, and there's lots of ways in which you, as a student, can become involved. Today, I'm pleased to introduce to you Peter G. Klein, who is Associate Professor of Applied Social Sciences and Director of the Quinn Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership at the University of Missouri. Peter Klein is truly a global scholar serves as an adjunct professor at the Department of Strategy and Management at the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration, and a visiting professor at, at the Center for Strategic Management and Globalization, Copenhagen Business School. Professor Klein received his BA in economics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his PhD in economics at the University of California, Berkeley, where he studied under Nobel Prize winning economist Oliver Williamson. Professor Klein's research focuses on the economics of organization, entrepreneurship, and corporate strategies. He is the author or editor of five books and over 60 articles, chapters, and reviews. His most recent work is entitled Organizing Entrepreneurial Judgment. Is it available on Amazon? It is available for pre-order. Yeah. I'll put some, I'll do some selling later. I'll let him plug that. Um, his work brings together the areas of business strategy and entrepreneurship and political economy. Uh, I would like to tell you that with all of that, I've known Professor Klein for nearly 20 years. I met him first as a graduate student, and with all those amazing accomplishments, um, I still think of him as the guy who married my colleague in graduate school. I, um, with that, I will give you um, Professor Peter Klein, who's going to talk to us about uh, what do economists know about entrepreneurship. Well, thank you all very much uh, for being here this afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here in your beautiful city uh, and on your wonderful campus. I've been to Charleston many times before, but this is my first time to visit uh, the College of Charleston campus. And uh, I'm, I'm just shocked by how beautiful uh, your campus is. Not so much how beautiful the professors are. I mean, some of them are OK. But um, as Professor Calcano mentioned, um, uh, my wife was also a graduate student at Auburn University at the same time as, as Professor Calcano. And, um, you know, students, I know that you hold your professors here in very high esteem as, prof as students at every university do, and you should, of course, but, you know, the professors are human too. And I remember one instance in particular. Um, my wife and Professor Calcano were uh, teaching assistants. They were TAs for this one notorious professor at Auburn. And I don't remember exactly what happened, but somehow they messed up copying an exam. They made the wrong copies, or they handed it out to the wrong students. I don't know what exactly you did, but the professor was really upset about it. And even still to this day, uh, he talks about it. My, my wife's maiden name is Johnson, and this professor, whom I just saw a couple of weeks ago, still talks about you know the Johnson Calcano rule which is some kind of policy that's designed to prevent the TAs from screwing up the exam as you did that that one time so you know uh, 
great economists, you know, they put on their pants one leg at a time, too, just like everybody else. But nonetheless, you should continue to, to hold them in very high esteem, especially, uh, especially that guy. Um, but I, I'm not here to talk about the old days. I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship, and uh, in particular, the academic field of entrepreneurship, the kind of research that scholars in entrepreneurship are doing, the kind of teaching and educational programs uh, that can be offered, but mainly because I am uh, uh, trained as an economist and I work in the area of entrepreneurial studies, I want to talk a little bit about what economics as a discipline can contribute specifically to the science of entrepreneurship, to the field of entrepreneurship. Um, there have been uh, courses and programs and degrees and so forth in entrepreneurship at universities in the U.S. and abroad for many, many years. But most of them, um, as is the case here, for example, they're not part of the economics department. They're either standalone departments or they're often bundled with management and organization theory. And um, the relationship between economics discipline and entrepreneurship as, a, as an applied field is sort of a tenuous one. And I want to try to address that a little bit today, you know, asking the question, what do economists know about entrepreneurship? Or to put it another way, what can economic analysis contribute to our understanding of entrepreneurs, to our understanding of entrepreneurship? Or to put it yet another way, is entrepreneurship something that economists ought to know about? Uh, and you might be surprised that the answer is more complex and a little bit more ambiguous than, than you might have expected. But you know, b by way of background, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there, there have been, you know, entrepreneurship has been an important part of the academy for some years. But in the last one or two decades, uh, the field of entrepreneurship has really exploded at U.S. and foreign colleges and universities. The number of courses, the number of majors and minors, the number of professors, the number of programs, such that one can really speak meaningfully about entrepreneurship as a kind of phenomenon. And I often describe, try to describe sort of the entrepreneurship phenomenon as I see it uh, uh, within higher education, also in public policy, uh, in government, and so forth, right? So what do I have in mind? Well, uh, lots of courses at colleges and universities. Surprisingly, not only in business schools, right? So many entrepreneurship programs, like the one at the College of Charleston, are located in the College of Business, but a surprising number of them are located uh, outside of business at different schools. Um, at my school, for example, at the University of Missouri, we do have entrepreneurship programs in the business school, but there are also entrepreneurship centers, institutes, courses, et cetera, uh, in uh, the liberal arts, in uh, the humanities, in engineering, in law, in the College of Social Work, in the School of Agriculture. Uh, even in the fine arts, they have courses in entrepreneurship, uh, you know, art entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in literature. And, you know, it, it's surprising that people are talking about being entrepreneurial in a variety of contexts that may have little to do with, you know, traditional kind of business subjects. Um, you know, entrepre uh, entrepreneurship uh, scholars have uh, their own journals. Uh, here's a number of the different scholarly journals that specialize in doing research in entrepreneurship. And like scholarly journals in other areas of the social sciences or business administration, they publish, you know, impenetrable articles with lots of math and statistics that almost nobody reads. Uh, but, but that gives them a sort of a feeling of legitimacy, like they're just as, they're just as crazy as every other field. Um, you have a lot of centers and institutes. Um, here are a few that are at large universities. You know, Stanford University has a Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, and here's one at the University of Illinois. Uh, uh, MIT has uh, an entrepreneurship center that was endowed by a $50 million gift from uh, the Legatum Center. 5-0 million, so you, you have a little ways to go before you can get in that territory uh, at, at Charleston. Um, there, there are private foundations. The Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City is the largest foundation that focuses exclusively on entrepreneurial activities, and they publish some very interesting data. They have something called the Kauffman Index of Entrepreneurial Activity that rates each U.S. state according to how much entrepreneurship, as they define it, takes place, how favorable is the climate for entrepreneurship. I forgot to look up the latest ranking, but uh, South Carolina has actually traditionally done, done fairly well 
uh, in the Kauffman Index and a lot of kind of old blue collar states, Michigan, uh, uh, Wisconsin and so on do relatively poorly. Um, entrepreneurship also has a Nobel laureate. And I don't know if anybody, if any of you know, who, does anybody know who this guy is? Yeah, there's Muhammad Yunus. He's uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. I think it was 2008. Um, <clears throat> and what is he famous for? Exactly. He, he's, he's the rock star of so-called microcredit or microfinance, microenterprise. Uh, he's the head of, uh, of the Grameen Bank, which operates in Bangladesh, one of the world's poorest countries, and specializes you know, giving very, very small loans to individuals so that they can become entrepreneurs, so that they can start their own businesses. And we're talking like you know, a $25 loan to a peasant woman in a small village so that she can buy a cow and set up a business you know, selling the milk or producing cheese or something like that. Um, uh, the, the theory is that, uh, you know, what does this have to do with peace? Well, I mean, the theory is that uh, a lot in the world's poorest regions, a lot of conflict, a lot of mer military conflict, you know, arises from conditions of desperate poverty. And if you could somehow alleviate that poverty, you would, you would, you would reduce the amount of conflict in these regions. And it is thought that maybe microenterprise indigenous bottom-up economic development is the key to uh, you know, sustainable growth in those parts of the world. I'll have a few comments to talk about, to say about that idea uh, a little bit later um, in the talk. <clears throat> Why is entrepreneurship so popular? Why has entrepreneurship become you know, such a hot topic at universities and think tanks and even in government and so forth? Well, I don't know exactly, but I have some, some conjectures, some hypotheses, right? One idea is, you know, maybe there's a genuine belief that the kinds of phenomena we associate with entrepreneurship, startup companies, uh, you know, inventions, venture capital, et cetera, you know, that they're, that they're more important to the economy, that they're a bigger deal for economic growth than maybe they were in the past. Um, you know, approaching it from the other direction, Right, it could be that uh, scholars who study economics, or that should say strategic management, sorry, not strategic man, uh, scholars in fields like strategic management and organization theory and so forth, have noticed, and this is something we'll talk about in a, in a round table later this afternoon, which I hope everybody can attend at 6, 5.30, um, uh, have noticed that they, you know, entrepreneurship must be important somehow but they don't have any entrepreneurship in their theories. That most economics textbooks don't have much to say about the entrepreneur. Many of them don't even have the word entrepreneur in the index. Yet clearly entrepreneurship is, matters for some reason. So maybe uh, scholars in these fields of study are trying to look at alternatives to their dominant models, their mainstream theories, and they're thinking, well, maybe we should study the entrepreneur and figure out a way that we could incorporate entrepreneurship into our textbooks and into our lectures and so forth. Um, you know, at, at, at the large state universities like South Carolina and Clemson, especially the schools that are uh, part of what they call the land-grant system, uh, the University of Missouri where I teach is a so-called land-grant institution. These are pu large public universities that were deliberately set up in the middle of the 19th century, late 19th century, with the mission of being a little bit more kind of outreach oriented, that they're not, you know, they're not just training upper middle class students in, you know, teaching them Greek and Latin or whatever, but, but providing practical instruction in agriculture and engineering and so forth. A lot of the schools that are something or other state or something or other A&M, Right, those are, the, that, 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 those are the land grant schools that were set up to teach engineering and the mechanical arts and agriculture and so forth. Um, at public universities, you often hear people talk about three missions, research, teaching, and service. But now many states, including mine, have added a for, an official fourth mission of the public research university, namely economic development how to make the state grow faster, how to improve per capita GDP in the state. 
and they think that maybe entrepreneurship is a way to do that. And so they want to sort of jump on the entrepreneurship bandwagon for that reason. But, you know, I've sort of, uh, that also might be part of the explanation, that it's just a bandwagon effect. Right? It's like, you know, celebrities like, what would be a good example? Maybe Paris Hilton. I mean, nobody can say what Paris Hilton is famous for except that she is a famous person. You know, she's famous for being famous, but she's never actually done anything. She's not like an athlete or a, or a singer or an actress. I guess she has been in a couple movies, but, you know, pretty bad ones. Um, you know, she's famous for being famous. I think a lot of universities are interested in entrepreneurship because every other university is interested in entrepreneurship. And, you know, like, like lemmings, you know, running into the sea or whatever, they're sort of getting into the game without really having a good reason for doing so. I'm not suggesting that's the case everywhere, but I think there is a little bit of a bubble, you know, like the real estate bubble of the last few years or the tech bubble, internet bubble of the 90s. I think there's a little bit of an entrepreneurship bubble and I suspect that a few years down the road there will be some kind of a bust and a shakeout. And of course, you know, scholars like myself, I, I'm, I'm assuming that I'll survive the shakeout and I'll be stronger for it. Uh, but of course that could be wishful thinking, we'll see. Um, okay, but, but what is entrepreneurship anyway? But I've sort of talked about entrepreneurship, but I haven't told you what entrepreneurship is, what the word entrepreneurship means, what it is to be an entrepreneurial person, or to, to, to think entrepreneurially. And it turns out that it's surprisingly difficult to give a concise definition of entrepreneur and entrepreneurship and so on. Uh, in fact, if you read the literature, if you look at studies, books, articles, and so forth on entrepreneurship, you'll find a huge variety of definitions and conceptions. And it, it, it can be very frustrating and, and, and confusing. Uh, but I have a few ways that have been helpful to me in sort of thinking through what entrepreneurship is. But look, if I just ask you, if I just throw out the word entrepreneur, you know, what immediately pops into your head, you know, the word association game. Well, a lot of times people think about, you know, famous tech guys, right? You all know who these people are, right? Who's the guy in the white sweater? That's Bill Gates, right? This must have been, this is probably like circa 1978, 1979. You know, he was really, really a nerd, even more so than he is now. And this is the other guy. Where's, there's the other guy, Steve Wozniak. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the Apple. Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft uh, with Bill Gates. So a lot of times you think of uh, Steve Jobs, Sergey Brin, uh, the guys who founded Facebook. You've all seen that movie, The Social Network, right? You think of them as entrepreneurs. Or you might think of you know, famous inventors like Thomas Edison or famous industrialists like John D. Rockefeller Jr., right? The titans of industry. You might think of them as great entrepreneurs. Now, you might actually think of companies rather than people. What's entrepreneurship? Well, that's, you know, that's Apple or Google, right? Or even a, a company that uh, is not as well known, although its products certainly are 3M, right? A diversified manufacturing company located in Minneapolis. And they may know what, 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 what are some of 3M's famous inventions Scotch tape, right? Ma the magic tape. What else? Even better than that. Post-it notes, yeah. This is the company that brought us post-it notes. Uh, 3M is widely regarded as a very entrepreneurial company because for their technical workers, you know, their engineers and their research workers, it's part of the job contract that you get one day a week free time to work on projects that you just think are interesting. Right, so you get to use the company equipment, the laboratory, and so on to work on projects where there may not be any obvious commercial value, but just things that you think are fun and interesting. Some other companies have these kinds of policies as well. And it's thought that maybe this will stimulate creativity. Maybe down the road there will be some commercial payoff from this kind of you know, free, uh, unrestricted experimentation. Um, you know, some people think of entire societies or economies when they hear about entrepreneurship. Um, a very prominent scholar in the entrepreneurship field named David Audresh, his, his recent book is called The Entrepreneurial Society. And he asks, how can we make 
our entire society more entrepreneurial. An uh, interesting book by um, three scholars associated with the Kauffman Foundation uh, came out in 2010, I think. It's called Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism. And they say you can evaluate an entire economic system in, by thinking about it entrepreneurially. So good capitalism is dynamic, inventive, creative, or what they call entrepreneurial capitalism. Whereas bad capital, you know, and, and that's like the U.S. or uh, the Nordic countries, uh, maybe some Southeast Asian countries. Bad capitalism is crony capitalism, bureaucratic capitalism. It's, it's, it's you know, sort of stagnant. They have in mind like France or Italy or other countries where there isn't much innovation and everything's bureaucratized. But look, the point I'm making is, you know, you know, what's sort of the, the level of analysis or the unit of analysis for thinking about entrepreneurial things? For some people, it's individuals. For some people, it's firms. For some people, it's entire societies. So th that can be very confusing as we try to come up with, with meaningful definitions of what exactly it is we're talking about. Now, a way that I find useful to understand this is the following. Uh, you know, a classification scheme that has proven useful to me um, is to think about, sort of distinguish two different ways to think about entrepreneurship. The first is to think about entrepreneurship as sort of an outcome or a phenomenon to be studied, right? I call this the usual perspective because I think this is most common in entrepreneurship courses and programs. So for, what do I mean? For example, d take the unit of analysis to be the individual person and define an entrepreneur as a person who is self-employed. Okay? So if you own your own business, if you work for yourself, then you're an entrepreneur. If you work in a company or you work you know, for somebody else, you're an employee. So entrepreneurship then becomes kind of a job category and you know, when you fill out your tax forms or you fill out some census form, you know, it asks you, what's your occupation? Physician, teacher, attorney, truck driver, plumber, entrepreneur, you know, scientist, whatever. Entrepreneur is just another job category, right? Or it, it could refer to a kind of firm, you know, a startup company. So maybe entrepreneurial means new firms, young firms, high growth firms, et cetera. Maybe it's the whole industry that you apply uh, uh, that, that label to. But the point is, in, in this sense, entrepreneurship is a phenomenon to be studied using the standard tools of statistics and history and economics and sociology and psychology. You know, we, what, what's the advantage of this? Well, we can measure the amount of entrepreneurship by counting. We can count the number of small firms. We can count the number of startup companies in a given year. We can ask what's the self-employment rate, what percent of people in South Carolina are self-employed, and compare that to Georgia or North Carolina or whatever, or France or whatever we want, and then measure the amount of entrepreneurship. Okay. Also, we can teach it. Right? We can teach how to run a small business. We can teach some skills like you know, how to get venture funding, how to write a business plan, how to do basic marketing and accounting and so on. You know, we, we can write books. We can have an entrepreneurship book in the Dummies series. You know, this is basically entrepreneurship for dummies, though they don't use the word. I mean, they don't use the word entrepreneurship. They use the word dummies. Okay, um, now, that's fine. Uh, wrong with that. But think about the way that we often use this terminology. For example, I have a teenage son at home, and like most teenage boys, you know, the main thing that he does is eat, right? You know, vast quantities of food that is beyond my comprehension. He's always hungry, and so a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm working at my desk or I'm plopped on the couch watching TV, and I hear, Dad, there's nothing to eat in the house. Come make me something. You gotta go to the store and buy me something. And what do I say? I say, come on. Please be a little entrepreneurial about it. Now, I don't mean go start a company, <laughs> right? I just mean think a little bit, you know, look in the cup, look in the cabinets, put some creativity into it, exercise some initiative. You could actually make yourself a sandwich without the sandwich having to be delivered to you, right? 
So a lot of times when we say, you know, that, you know, Professor Calcano, he's kind of an entrepreneurial guy. What do we mean? Well, he's creative. He's always having new ideas. He's always thinking on his feet. It may not have anything to do with a specific kind of company that he created or that he is involved with. Right? So a lot of times we might think of entrepreneurship as kind of a way of thinking or a way of acting. Right? So maybe we mean creativity, boldness, imagination. Now, there are some specific concepts of entrepreneurship that come out of the economics literature. And uh, I'll say more about them in just a moment. Uh, some specific you know, uh, characterization of entrepreneurship as a way of thinking or acting, such as alertness to opportunities, which is a, a, a concept that has been elaborated by an economist named Israel Kirzner. For, for Kirzner, entrepreneurship is the act of sort of recognizing or discovering or being aware of opportunities to, to, to create some kind of a gain, right? Simple example would be, you know, walking down the street. Actually, I'll, I'll stop for just a minute to tell this joke. Uh, you got any money on you? Give me a dollar or something. Or a 20 would be even better. Or a 50. Give me, give me some money. Oh, this is just a, a okay, it's just a dollar. But this is just a prop, right? So, you know, there's, there's an old joke about the two economists who are walking down the street together, you know, in conversation. And one of them stops to pick up a dollar bill, and his colleague stops him and says, don't do that. He says, well, there's some money right there. And the other economist says, no, there's not. He says, what do you mean? It's right there. His friend says, look, if there was a $20 bill on the sidewalk, somebody would have picked it up. And the other guy goes, oh, yeah, you're right. And he like, keeps on walking. You know, the money's right there, and they just walk right past it. So a lot of economic models, how many of you are economics majors? How many of you have taken economics courses? Almost everybody, right? Our standard models that emphasize markets in equilibrium are markets in which all of the $20 bills have already been picked up. There's no more profit opportunity out there. All the gaps in the market have been exploited. All the opportunities have been recognized and taken advantage of. But Kirshner says, look, you know, there are some people who walk down the street. You know, there really are some $20 bills on the sidewalk. And some people just don't, aren't very aware of them. You know, people, walk, people are talking on their phone, or most of you guys, your generation, right? You all have your earbuds in pretty much 24-7. You're just not even aware. But then there are other people who, for whatever reason, are just a little bit sharper, and they're more alert to their surroundings, and they see things that other people don't to grab them. And this is supposed to be a metaphor. Okay, I'll give it back. Um, this is going to be my tip. This is supposed to be a metaphor for, you know, like a business opportunity. For example, you know, there's like a gap in the market. Oh, you know, people would be willing to pay, what did you say you paid for this, 50? You know, people would be willing to pay $50 for a little remote control presenter thing. There's not one currently on the market. I can purchase the materials and the labor and assemble it for $35 and I'll have something left over w w when I sell these. That's an opportunity for me to make $15 on each one of these. Nobody else has seen that opportunity, but I did. And so I went out into the market and I bought those resources, those factors. I assembled them to these things and I sold them. Right? So for Kersner, entrepreneurship is the act of being alert to these kinds of opportunities. For another famous economist, Joseph Schumpeter, entrepreneurship is innovation. It's coming up with new stuff, uh, new ways of producing existing stuff, new markets to which you can sell, and so forth. Um, uh, another economist, named, a famous American economist named Frank Knight, um, characterized entrepreneurship slightly differently as what he called judgmental decision making under conditions of uncertainty, or judgment for short. And this is, this is also in Ludwig von Mises, and you know, to name a really famous person in, in my own work, um, I've also taken advantage or built on this particular notion of entrepreneurship. But, you know, what you should see is that um, if entrepreneurship is a way of thinking or acting, that's not an outcome, right? That's like, it's like an input or it's just like a way that we are all the time. In other words, how would you measure it? How would you get data on the quantity or quality of creativity in the economy? How would you measure the amount of alertness? 
how would you collect data and do statistical analysis on judgment in an economy? It's not at all obvious how you would do that. And so a lot of researchers have shied away from these kind of notions, maybe deep down thinking that they're somehow important, but that we really can't study them because they can't be counted, right? So, you know, entrepreneurship as a way of thinking or acting, it might be manifest in something like self-employment, right? It, it, it's correlated with or related somehow to starting a new company, right? So starting a new company involves some initiative and boldness. It may be characterized as recognizing an opportunity and exercising judgment and so forth. But notice that that's not the only venue in which those things can take place. You know, you as a college student can be alert and innovative and exercise good judgment. My son can be entrepreneurial in making a sandwich, even if it doesn't show up in any data on self-employment or new venture formation, okay? Now, actually, I have a slightly, uh, you know, a little bit more complicated way of making this distinction is one that I did in a, an article in 2008 I used the terms occupational, structural, and functional as three different ways of thinking about entrepreneurship. And all I meant was, you know, some articles and books and speeches and so forth uh, define, you know, they, they take the, the entrepreneur to mean a self-employed individual and they measure, right, so the unit of analysis is the individual and an entrepreneur is defined as an individual who's self-employed there's a lot of li literature by labor economists trying to explain why do we get self, why do some people choose to be self-employed, other people choose to work for an existing firm. Uh, there's personality studies that ask if you, you know, would be a good fit for self-employment and so forth. This is distinguished from what you might call structural concepts of entrepreneurship, in which the unit of analysis is not an individual, but a firm or maybe an industry. And, you know, the idea is that an entrepreneurial firm is a new firm or a small firm. Uh, you know, an entrepreneurial industry or an entrepreneurial society is one that has a lot of small firms, a lot of new firms, a lot of high growth firms and so forth. Now, th this is all well and good, but these are, both of these are very distinct from what I call functional concepts of entrepreneurship, where entrepreneurship is conceived not as an outcome to be studied, not as a phenomenon to be measured, but as a way of studying things, a way of doing things, some kind of an abstract economic function like the function of alertness or innovation or judgment, right? Now, uh, a lot of the classic economic studies that take this kind of functional approach have two weaknesses, right? One is that they often tend to, you know, what we call black box. They sort of black box the function itself. In other words, they don't really tell you the nature of what an entrepreneur is or how this, how alertness or whatever it is, how it really functions. They're just interested in the effects that it has on resource allocation or something like that. You know, this is sort of like the, it's sort of the Forrest Gump approach to entrepreneurship. So, you know, Forrest Gump, as you know, had many wise sayings. I guess he got them all from his mother, right? So. You know, the most famous is life is like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. But remember his other famous saying about stupidity? Mama always said, stupid is as stupid does, right? So in this approach, entrepreneurship is as entrepreneurship does, right? Entrepreneurship is that which brings markets into equilibrium. It's that which brings about innovation of various kinds. It's that which generates profit on the market. But nobody says exactly what it is. They're just interested in what it does. But the other thing is, you know, there's not an obvious relationship between things like alertness, innovation, and judgment, and self-employment and small firms. Okay, there's not a direct one-to-one -one mapping, which sort of throws into, it makes us frustrated or confused about the applied literature. I mean, how do we study it if we can't count it? If it doesn't manifest itself in something that we have data on, what do we do? Well, let me give you some ideas for what we might do. Um, you know, I should just mention in passing for the economists in the audience, and since I'm an economist and since I was asked to talk about economics, this is the one slide that, that, that counts. Um, you know, this is, entrepreneurship is not a new idea in the history of economic thought. 
many of the most famous economists in history have given a prominent place to the entrepreneur in their theories, in their studies. In fact, um, a guy named Richard Cantillon, or Cantillon if you prefer the French pronunciation, who's sometimes considered, you know, at least one of the founders, or the, 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 his a book that he published in 1755, or that was, uh, yeah, that published in 1755, was sort of the first systematic book-length treatment of economic subjects. It was called The Essay on the Nature of Commerce in General. Uh, it was sort of the, fir the first book in economics. It was really all about the entrepreneur and how the entrepreneur drives the market, how the entrepreneur determines production, et cetera. Uh, but people including some of whom I've already mentioned, Jean-Baptiste Say, Carl Manger, Joseph Schumpeter, Frank Knight, Ludwig von Mises, Israel Kirzner, uh, Theodore Schultz, a Nobel laureate in economics, uh, who uh, published in the 70s and 80s on entrepreneurship. All of them placed the entrepreneur at the center of their theories about markets and economic performance. But then something happened, right? Uh, you know, sort of the middle of the 20th century, entrepreneurship began to drop out of discourse in economics. You know, it's hard to say why exactly. Um, but it, 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 it's probably the case that, you know, as economists became more interested in using math, right, mathematical modeling, and you guys who had econ courses, we were talking at lunch about, you know, how much calculus is required to study, um, you know, to take an economics, intermediate economics course. I mean, Richard Cantillon did not use calculus in his book on entrepreneurship and economics. It was really a fairly modern development, all the math and stat and so forth, the emphasis on equilibrium states. And those of you who have taken econ courses, right, you probably spent a lot of time on the so-called perfectly competitive model, you know, a market that is in perfect, a market that is perfectly competitive, or a, a state of perfect competition. This is a fictional, you know, hypothetical kind of market which has certain attributes or features that I'm sure you guys have all studied. But, you know, it doesn't correspond in any way to, act, to any actual market, right? And it, in a market that is already in equilibrium, a market that is perfectly competitive, you know, there's really nothing for an entrepreneur to do. There's no place for entrepreneurship in that kind of theory or model. So I think economists just sort of gave up. They said, we don't need entrepreneurship. We don't have a way to put an entrepreneur in our models. We don't know how to formalize or mathematize the entrepreneurial function, so we'll just pretend it isn't there. And if you press most mainstream mathematical equilibrium-based economists, you know, if you hit them up at a cocktail party or something, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, entrepreneurs are important, and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, blah, blah, blah. But then they, then they forget about that Monday morning when they go to work and start doing their theorizing and teaching about economics, okay? Uh, an economist named William Baumol, who's contributed a lot to the entrepreneurship literature, famously called the entrepreneur the specter which haunts economic models. He, he goes to say, you know, like, uh, like the, the ghost in Hamlet, I guess it's the ghost of Hamlet's father, right, that scares Hamlet and is sort of haunting the castle. The entrepreneur is like that. He's like a ghost that haunts economic models and gives economists the willies, the heebie-jeebies, right? They would just like as soon pretend that he isn't there. Um, now, uh, in the time remaining, which is how much time? When am I supposed to stop? Eight, eight nine o'clock tonight, is that it? Okay, no, but we can go till, we have till four, we have the room till 4.30, okay. Um, I'll just mention a few things in passing about you know, sort of specific contributions of economists and economic analysis to entrepreneurship. And I won't go into much detail about these. Um, uh, I'll briefly mention how entrepreneurship might affect the theory of the firm, what, what it might mean to have an entrepreneurial theory of the firm. This is something I've been working on a lot. Say a few words about public policy toward entrepreneurship and maybe a comment on the role that entrepreneurship can play in economic growth relative to other potential drivers of economic growth. Now, if you really want to know more about what economists can say, if you want all the details and a very brilliant and clear presentation 
of the role of economic analysis in entrepreneurship, you need only buy these two wonderful books. Um, a, a book that I published in 2010 called The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, and then another book that Professor Calcano generously mentioned in the introduction uh, called Organizing Entrepreneurial Judgment, written with a, a, a co-author in Denmark, uh, is just, you, it's available for pre-order on Amazon, uh, and I think you can actually get the book in Europe from Amazon, the UK Amazon site. Um, I strongly recommend these books to you, in particular, The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, the older book. I can virtually guarantee that you will get your money's worth out of that book, and the reason I can say that is because you can download the entire book for free. Um, it's available on the Mises Institute website, that's the publisher. It's a sort of an open source, creative commons kind of a thing. You can get the full text of the book as a PDF file without paying a single penny, and I guarantee that it will be worth that. Okay. Um, a few words about the firm. Um, you know, in, in my own research, uh, I, I've built on this idea that comes from Frank Knight, uh, characterizing entrepreneurship as judgment. And what he means by judgment is, you know, decision making in an uncertain world under conditions of uncertainty when we don't have a kind of a straightforward model or theory that tells us exactly what to do. We don't have a formula or a recipe that can tell us how to behave. Have any of you had a, a, an economics course or maybe like a, even a management course where they talked about you know, decision making under uncertainty and they have like probabilities and you multiply things and calculate expected values? Have any of you had a course like that? I mean, you know, th there's some approaches to these kinds of problems that say, well, uh, you know, should I carry my umbrella today or not? Well, I don't know if it's gonna rain but I know that the probability of rain, you know, the weatherman said there's a 64% there's a chance of rain, right? And if I get caught in the rain without my umbrella, that costs, you know, minus 10 worth of utility. But if I have to lug my umbrella around all day without using it, that costs me minus four in utility. But, you know, so given if I multiply those things by the likelihood of rain, what's the, what's the optimal course of action? Have any of you studied those kinds of problems in classes? A few of you have. Um, Knight says, look, there are a lot of conditions, like, for example, starting a business or making any kind of, in any kind of commercial transaction, where you don't have that kind of formula. You don't have a recipe to follow. You have to exercise some kind of, you can call it intuition or kind of a knack, a way of sort of anticipating what future market conditions are going to be like. If I pay $35 of materials, to make this thing, will I really be able to sell it for $50? How many will I be able to sell? What will competitors try to do? Uh, you know, is there a chance that these might be regulated by the government because they have a laser in them and that could put somebody's eye out or whatever? Um, it, it's, there's no way to collapse all that information into a mathematical formula such that anybody with the formula would know what's the right thing to do. You know, the entrepreneur has to exercise some what might call judgment, make up his own his or her own mind in a kind of subjective, intuitive way, right? Um, that, according to Knight, is the essence of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is that faculty of sort of making decisions about resource allocation under conditions of true, genuine uncertainty. Now, one implication of this is that you know the primary entrepreneurial act is not the discovery of a market opportunity, but rather the investment in the resources that are necessary to bring that opportunity to fruition. So if I, I gave you the dollar back, right? If I went back to my story with the dollar bills, right? The, the Frank Knight's version of the story with the dollar bill would not be that you walk by the street and there it is, and all you gotta do is pick it up, but rather you're walking down the street and you know you see a little green piece of paper under a rock. You know there's just like a little tiny corner of it sticking out under the rock. And it might be a $20 bill or a $100 bill. It might just be a bubblegum wrapper. You can't really tell. The only way to find out is you got to go over to the hardware store and buy a shovel and then you got to dig out the rock and maybe there will be money there, maybe there won't. Right? If you know if it costs $10 to shovel 
and the opportunity cost of your time is five dollars and you dig it up and there's a twenty dollar bill under there you've made a profit right you've earned five dollars of pure entrepreneurial profit but if it turns out to be a bubblegum wrapper then you've you know you've earned a loss of fifteen dollars right so entrepreneurship is about the willingness to invest resources that you control in the pursuit of profits you know not knowing for sure whether you'll earn a profit uh, or a loss. Um, part one of the implication is that to exercise judgment, you have to actually own some stuff, right? So the entrepreneur function in this perspective is closely associated with or is embedded in the capitalist function. You gotta have stuff. You gotta have skin in the game, as they say, to be an entrepreneur. Um, uh, there's an interesting quote. This guy Knight was a pretty creative writer, um, but I won't read you all of his quotes. Um, so, you know, the, the, how this applies to the firm, the theory of the firm, is that the firm is the entrepreneur plus these resources, these assets, what we call alienable assets, meaning stuff that you can buy and sell. So not just your own labor, right? But stuff you can buy and sell. Uh, that's what the firm is. The firm is the entrepreneur plus some assets that the entrepreneur owns and controls. And one implication is that under conditions of uncertainty, you know, firms are going to grow and shrink and diversify and, and retrench and merge and divest and go bankrupt and be reformed and so on because entrepreneurs are experimenting with different combinations of resources under conditions of uncertainty. Okay. Um, you know, you, you can apply this, and one of the things that I do in my newer book is to try to apply this to the multi-person firm. Uh, here we look at uh, some of the literature on the firm inspired by the famous economist Ronald Coase. Have any of you encountered Ronald Coase in your classes? Some of you have. Coase asks, you know, how, how many firms will there be? Why, why do firms exist? What's the internal structure of the firm? And so forth. And we develop... Uh, sort of a theory of hierarchy by extending Frank Knight's notion of judgment sort of down throughout the firm. We say that employees can be regarded as proxy entrepreneurs who exercise a kind of delegated judgment on behalf of the firm's owners who possess sort of the primary or what we call original judgment rights that go along with resource allocation. And so the question of delegation how much authority do you want to give to employees to decide things on their own without you telling them what to do, right? You want to empower them to act as entrepreneurs on your behalf, right? You want them to exercise good judgment on the part of the resource owners who hold these original judgment rights. But the problem is when you delegate authority, those to whom you delegate it may use that authority in ways that benefits them rather than you, right? They might shirk on the job. They might, uh, you know, the university gave Professor Calcano a computer to put on his desk, uh, but they don't monitor his use. Actually, they do. I was wasn't supposed to tell you, but, you know, I mean, they might say, look, you can, you can do whatever you want on your computer. We're not going to control that. But then how do they know that he's not just, you know, buying and selling on eBay and playing with Facebook and looking at ESPN and all that, rather than doing things related to his job as a professor. So how centralized or decentralized you want to be is determined by this trade-off between encouraging value-creating productive entrepreneurship and discouraging value-destroying or you know, destructive, unproductive entrepreneurship. Um, let me say a word or two about public policy. Right? So at the national level, right, are there some government policies that would encourage people to engage in productive, value-creating entrepreneurship while discouraging rent-seeking and other kinds of unproductive activities that may involve initiative and judgment and so forth? This distinction between productive and unproductive entrepreneurship comes from a, a scholar named William Baumol, who... Um, who introduced this distinction to the literature. Now here, let me refer back to what I said before, right? My distinction between occupational, structural, and functional concepts of the entrepreneur. Uh, if, if entrepreneurship is self-employment, 
or if entrepreneurship is small firms, you know, then you could you can imagine, right, that there might be government policies that could give you more self-employment or more small firms or new firms, right? I mean, the tax code, you could have a lower tax on self-employment income and you know, and a higher tax on wage income that would encourage people on the margin to move into self-employment. You can directly subsidize small business and new business, right, by giving them subsidized loans. Uh, you can set up these publicly funded incubators that try to train business owners and help scientists commercialize their technologies and set up research parks, give prizes for uh, inventions, et cetera. But the record on these, we've had these kind of programs for a long time, and they don't appear to be very successful in generating economic value. A book that came out a couple years ago by a very good scholar in this field named Josh Lerner uh, is, a, is a history of the U.S. Small Business Administration. It's called Boulevard of Broken Dreams, and it's all about what he claims to be the failure of the Small Business Administration to do anything other than channel loans to politically favored individuals and groups, but that it hasn't done anything to generate economic growth or improve economic well-being. And actually, it, fortunate, lucky for me, I discovered this on the plane ride down to South Carolina on, on uh, Monday. Uh, Monday's Wall Street Journal, I don't know if any of you noticed this, had a debate, should the Small Business Administration be abolished? There's an essay saying yes, and then there's a counterpoint essay saying no. So if you're interested in this, look at Monday's Wall Street Journal. And you can find a debate about whether or not we should have the SBA, which is designed to encourage small business by giving government subsidized loans, okay? Um, you know, there are indirect kind of subsidies too through regulation and so forth. But look, if we, my point is, if we think of entrepreneurship in this occupational or structural way, maybe you could conceive of using government policy to get more of it. Now that doesn't guarantee you that having more of it will be any good, that it will produce anything of value, but at least you can have more stuff you can count and measure. But, but if we think of entrepreneurship as an abstract function, like alertness, innovation, judgment, then it's not at all clear how you can you know, get more of that through a specific government policy or rule probably the best that you can do is try to establish, you know, stable rules of the game, have a, an institutional environment, a policy environment that encourages free markets and, uh, a, 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 you know, free trade and so forth. Um, but there isn't much you can do to micromanage. Let me just conclude uh, by elaborating on this point. I'm gonna actually going to skip a, a, a wonderful slide that I had. Um, Right, so this notion of entrepreneurship as an abstract function, right, I mean, it's fundamental to all human behavior. We all act entrepreneurial on some scale every day, right? The decision to come to this lecture was an entrepreneurial one in the sense that you didn't know exactly whether it would be any good. I think some of you get extra credit for coming, right? But maybe it's not a lot of extra credit and there are other things you could be doing with your time. So you don't know if the information you get is gonna be worth what it costs you to come. So you're acting entrepreneurial in a sense, entrepreneurially in a sense, um, but this is not obviously something you can measure and count and so forth. It's hard to assess to what extent this contributes to growth relative to other things that might contribute to economic growth. Now, if entrepreneurship is self-employment or small firms or new firms, you know, there is a lot of research suggesting that self-employment and new firm formation might contribute not so much to economic growth per se, but to a particular kind of economic growth, what they call sustainable economic growth, right? The old development model for a poor country or a poor region or a poor county in South Carolina would be to try to attract a big factory to locate there, like how they've provided tax breaks and so on to get BMW to build its plant in, is it Greer? And uh, I understand there were a lot of incentives to get Boeing to locate its, to, to move the assembly of its 787 here to Charleston. Um, people think, often think that that is not the right way to go. If you depend on big outsiders to come in and create a big 
plant or a big factory or something, yeah, you might get some, you might get some new, new you, know, you might you get some employment growth, you get some job creation, but you know, then what happens when the factory shuts down? What happens if they decide to offshore it and move it overseas? I mean, look at Detroit, right? Detroit was for a long time a one industry town, and when that industry in the U.S. went down the toilet, Detroit, as you know, as you know now, is in very bad shape uh, economically. People say, well, look, if you encourage bottom-up indigenous growth, you want people in uh, Charleston to create more new businesses and small businesses. That's economic growth that's more tied to Charleston. It's more sustainable, to use the popular term. But you know, the few studies that have been done on things like microcredit and microenterprise are pretty disappointing. They're pretty underwhelming in that there isn't a lot of evidence that microcredit and microenterprise, whether in very poor parts of the world like Bangladesh or in wealthier parts of the world like in the U.S., that it really does much for economic growth. We just don't have much evidence. The few studies that have been done suggest that it really doesn't contribute much to economic growth. You know, there may be some kind of social, cultural benefits. These peasant women in Bangladesh, they say, well, maybe they aren't making a lot of money with their one cow operation, and they're not growing and hiring workers, and they're not going to become the next Microsoft. But it do does give th this woman a sense of empowerment, independence from, you know, the tribal leaders and the men in the village who might, uh, was, you know, not sympathize with her ambitions and so forth. There may be cultural benefits. The other thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, should we encourage more people to become self-employed or to start a company? Not everybody wants to. I mean, look at us professors. I mean, we don't get paid that much. Uh, but please, you know, encourage the university to pay us more. But you know, we don't get paid that much. And most of us believe, perhaps mistakenly, that if we weren't professors, we could be making a lot more money. I mean, I know for a fact that if I weren't a college professor, my next best opportunity would be CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I'd have a penthouse in Manhattan. I'd have a few limousines, a Learjet, and all that kind of stuff. There's no doubt about that. But I just don't want to. I don't want the stress. Right? I like knowing that I have a steady job and I'm not going to get fired. Um, you know, my income doesn't fluctuate all that much. So I don't want to be an entrepreneur in the occupational or functional sense. I prefer being a, you know, low status, underpaid, but, but steadily employed college professor. And, you know, as they say on Seinfeld, not that there's anything wrong with that. Right? There's no reason that you shouldn't be something else instead of what you are. One of the beefs that I have, I'll stop in just a second, with some of the entrepreneurship training programs that we have at universities is we sort of, we, we, we imply, and maybe even say outright, that being self-employed, starting your own company is somehow better. That, that's a higher calling than, you know, working at the factory or, you know, working as a wage slave. You know, they give you a test and they say, Professor Walker, you know, let's see how you score on this test. You know, oh, well, you know, the scores indicate that you're not really suited for self-employment. Bless your heart. Um, you know, g go on and do something else. But we're subtly sending the message that that's not good. It's better to be self-employed. But why? I mean, there's no, no reason that we should favor one or the other. Okay, so. To conclude, um, what can policy do for entrepreneurship, for economic growth? Don't try to centrally plan innovation and entrepreneurship. You can't create the next Silicon Valley by passing a law, though lots of legislators think that they can. Um, you shouldn't be picking winners or losers. The government shouldn't be giving contracts to one technology over another, subsidizing one industry over another. And public policy should not be deciding how many people should be self-employed and how many people should work for big companies. We should let the free market sort that out, right? So the best thing that public policy can do is to foster an environment that allows people to choose their occupations, their business activities, encourages people who are 
professional business entrepreneurs to exercise good judgment. You know, that means free capital markets, free labor markets, sound money, you know, no superinflationary policies like the policy of the current Fed, uh, no bailouts, no Keynesian stimulus, just protect private property, the rule of law, free and open competition, and let the market decide in exactly what form entrepreneurship will take place. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time.